Thanks very much. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us here this afternoon. Uh, my name's Colin. I'm a principal engineer in our infrastructure networking team. I'm based in Dublin and Ireland. And I kind of specialize in looking after our data center networks. So we're going to take a look today at some of the work that goes on in supporting our global network infrastructure. So as I'm sure you're all aware, we have lots of uh, networking and content delivery services that are provided as part of AWS. I'm not going to talk to you today about really any of these. What I'm going to talk about is the global network infrastructure that underpins all of these services and how, how they work together. Uh, a couple of points during the talk, we will kind of pop up from this substrate sub layer and see where some of these infrastructure components are visible to you as customers. But we're really our goal for today is to talk about how our approach has evolved over the last decade or so and how we think about designing, building, and operating the network. Um, so to that kind of our agenda for today, uh, we're going to talk about some of the key themes and kind of tenants we, we think about when we, op when we build the network. Uh, we're going to do a deep dive into the data center network, because that's my like, kind of specialty area. We're going to talk about some of the things we do to operate the network at the scale we do. Uh, then we're going to step back and have a look at the uh, availability zones and the regional network topology. Uh, we're going to take a quick look at network encryption, which was a, a, fe a feature we announced earlier in the year. And then we'll finish off by looking at how the global network backbone ties all of our regions together. So as I said, we're, we're going to kick off with the key themes and tenants we, we apply to the network. And so um, these are going to be common across the talk, so I wanted to just get them out of the way at the start so we can have them in our mind as we go forward through the afternoon. Uh, so security is our key, most important tenant. Um, so we're going to talk about some of the security features we've implemented in the network. Availability is fundamental to what we do. It's table stakes both for us and for yourselves. And we've grown to have strong convictions about how we build and operate the network in order to make sure that we maintain the availability that you all depend on. In particular, we want to make sure that failures are constrained and isolated and don't spread any further than they have to. Um, for example, availability zones provide isolation within a region. Regions are isolated from each other. And we look at some of the isolation properties we have inside the data center. Then scalability is key. We want to be able to keep growing uh, and not be constrained at any point. And performance is vital. And, and the particular part of performance I focus on is ensuring that the network is consistent, that the performance is the same all the time, even when failures happen, that the failures don't impact the performance and we maintain consistency. And then lastly, we obviously want the network to be globally available. We want it to reach our customers wherever they are. So before we jump into the data center part, I want to talk briefly just about some host network features, because um, they, they're, they're important and, and enable some of the work we do in the data center network. So you've probably all seen this slide at various points over the last year or so. It's a, our Nitro architecture. Um, so in, from a network point of view, what's really important for me is that Nitro offloads in hardware lots of network features. Importantly, it gives us consistent network performance, but it also allows us to offload many traditionally complex network features, such as ACLs, security groups, um, VPC peering, uh, a lot of the hyperplane functions that underpin NLB, NAT gateway, private link, are implemented in the Nitro controller. And for me as the network designer for the infrastructure, this, the key property of this is that it removes the requirement for kind of special middle boxes that you might commonly find in traditional networks designs. And this all makes the network simpler and easier to build. Um, and just while we're talking about Nitro, I wanted to talk about one uh, key security feature we launched earlier in the year, uh, which is VPC encryption. Uh, so VPC encryption is hardware accelerated encryption of all of your network traffic from, a, from an instance. Uh, it's implemented in the hardware built by Annapurna Labs, that network card in the middle. You see there is our third generation Nitro card in, that's in C5Ns and similar N-series hardware. It encrypts your traffic all the time. There's nothing you need to do. You don't have to turn it on. It's always on. Um, and it does not impact performance. So we just encrypt all of the traffic within your VPC or between VPCs that are peered with each other. So that's just one of the little network security features we've shipped this year. But let's start off and dig into the data center network, because this is where I spend my time. So there's really two categories of traffic we have to worry about in the data center network. There's host-to-host -host traffic, which is going side-to-side, -side, or east-west, you'll see it referred to that way, and traffic that has to leave the data center. It's going either to a different data center, different availability zone, to another region or out to the internet. And we want to be able to scale each of these categories of traffic independently. We need them to be elastic. We need them to grow and, and not be constrained. And to give you just some context in terms of how much capacity we require, in terms of uh, host-to-host traffic, 
Uh, we, in my team, we're commonly working with either hundreds or thousands of terabits a second of capacity in the data center. Um, and in terms of traffic leaving the data center, um, it's smaller, uh, but it's still quite large scale. We're commonly working in units of tens of terabits a second of capacity egressing a data center. Um, so let's look at kind of how we want to go about building a network to deliver this. Um, and so we want to build a network, to build a network that's scalable, we want it to be built out of building blocks. We want something we can uh, scale easily. We want units of it that we can just keep adding in incrementally as the business grows and as we need new features. Um, in order to add those building blocks, we need them to be easy to install. We need them to be um, self-contained. We don't want them to bring additional complexity to the rest of the network. We want it to be stable. And we want them to be reasonably significant chunks of capacity. We want them to be able to allow us to scale in, in, in increments as we go. And in terms of how we're going to go about building these uh, building blocks, there's, there's kind of about two or three uh, areas we have to make decisions. There's the physical kind of router hardware choice. Uh, there's how we want to connect them together. And then finally, there's the control plane. And so we're going to dig in mainly to the first two today, and we'll, we might have to save the third one for a, a follow-up session. But let's talk about the hardware options. So Amazon and AWS, like most enterprises, started off using large-scale chassis systems. Um, this is kind of a nice uh, block diagram of kind of traditional chassis-based router. Um, and the first thing you're going to see looking at this is there's a lot of stuff going on. It's pretty complicated. Um, there's just lots and lots of moving parts. You've got on the left-hand side, you have the line cards. Uh, which have the physical ports you can attach to. Um, they usually have one or more forwarding ASICs involved. And then to interconnect all those line cards, we have our switch fabric cards on the right, and we need more than one of them in order to provide redundancy. And then to coordinate all these parts inside the box, we need some kind of brain, a control plane. And so we have a control plane CPU up the top. And it's responsible for keeping all of these things aligned and synchronized and operating correctly. Um, however, if it fails, you're going to lose a huge amount of capacity and so you probably want a second control plane CPU in order to have redundancy. But now you have to bring in a whole bunch of additional complexity and protocols to manage keeping them in sync, detecting failure, and, and taking over, which has its own set of reliability problems. Um, the other challenge with, a, with this kind of architecture is that it's difficult to troubleshoot. There's lots of places inside the device for failures to occur, and it can be challenging to then isolate and deal with them and, and localize them. And so. And if you find yourself having to take the device out of service because you think something's wrong with it and you want to work on it, it's a large amount of capacity. So the blast radius of device failure is really significant. And at a really practical level, if you do discover there's something physically wrong with it, it's really big and heavy and it takes lots of people to actually move and do a hardware swap. Um, and so we, we didn't really love this approach. And so we, 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 the team sat down and we deep dived and we thought about what we wanted to achieve. And we kind of came at it from a different angle, which was we wanted to focus on really simple network devices, single chip boxes. And so this is basically the block diagram of pretty much every network device we've deployed in the last 10 years, uh, eight or nine years. Um, you have a single forwarding ASIC connected to the front panel ports on the switch. You have a single uh, control plane CPU attached to it. And it's a fixed form factor. It's usually only like one rack unit high. Um, so it's pretty easy for someone to handle if they need to replace it. Um, and unlike the large scale chassis, because you know how many ports are going to be in the switch when you build it, you can get the CPU with the correct amount of capacity to support all the control plane functions you want. Sometimes when you have large chassis platforms, you end up getting the CPU sizing incorrect. And as, it, as your usage grows, you can find that you can run out of CPU and the network can become unstable. So we like being able to have these fixed devices and that we can integrate, integrate them into the network. And so, yeah, we want to talk about some of these trade-offs, like simple, versus complex, um, ability to, to manage them. Uh, while large chassis have some benefits in that you have less devices, once you cross a certain point, that, that benefit goes away and you, you, you still need to build the software to manage them. Um, and in and while in, there's the belief that you can use like different types of line cards, you end up being constrained by what the chassis designer designed at the beginning and subsequent line cards might not fit or might not interoperate and you certainly can't have multiple vendors. Um, they don't interact. So by having standard interconnects, we're able to take advantage of the fixed form factor design. Okay. So what are the building blocks we have in the network? And so the first one 
is our host racks that actually contains the physical servers that are running our, our services. Um, so every rack has its own power source, has its own network infrastructure. Um, and how is that visible to you? This is one of the first places where we actually expose the network infrastructure to customers. And we do that in two ways. Uh, firstly, we have partition placement groups. And so partition placement groups are an EC2 feature that allows you to get groups of EC2 instances, and this we call them partitions, and ensure that all of the EC2 instances in a given partition group do not share any physical racks with the instances in any of the other partition groups. And so this can be used, for example, if maybe you had something like a video processing pipeline where you wanted to ensure that the redundant pipelines never had any failure modes in common, or maybe you know, Cassandra clusters, or things like that where you want to ensure capacity is separated for redundancy. And then there's a second, a second related placement group called spread placement groups, uh, which is aimed at a, a much smaller number of instances, usually limited to seven. And where there you can guarantee that no instance in the placement group shares a physical rack with any other instance in the placement group. And so this is mainly aimed at things like database clusters or maybe some legacy applications that need to be kept separate or things like locking leader election, those kind of systems that depend on quorums and you want to make sure there are no correlated failure modes. So that's kind of our, our first building block. But we want to look at what's, our, what's going to be our generic building block. And so we start and we go, let's have a building block. And that's, that's, but what are we going to put inside it? And so we're going to take our fixed form factor platforms and we're going to grab a bunch of them and stick them in there. Now, just a quick disclaimer, in order to make the network diagrams easier to draw and for everyone to follow along, I've simplified a lot of these and we just have less devices. We're going to keep the topology the same, but uh, in our real network, we'd have much more, many more devices inside this building block, but just for, for today, we're going to keep it uh, simple with four here in each layer on screen. And so we, we, we arrange the devices in two tiers. Uh, the bottom tier, we're going to use for providing ports for connecting to our host racks. And the tier on top is going to be used for connecting to out of, out of the, the, the data center and up northbound. But we need to connect them together. And so how do we do that? And so we end up with a topology that looks a little bit like this. Again, I've eliminated a lot of the duplicate lines just to make it easy to follow. But the rule we follow here is that for a device in a given layer has at least one link to every device in the layer it's adjacent to. So in this case, if we look at the device in the bottom left, it has a link to each of the routers in the tier above it. And the ratio of ports facing down to ports facing up is always one to one. So we're never constrained. There's no oversubscription inside this building block. And we, we don't find ourselves capacity constrained. And you might be thinking, this pattern looks really similar to that chassis design I showed you earlier. And you're correct, it is. It has a lot in common. But because we've moved to discrete physical units, uh, we, we mitigate a lot of the, the challenges that came with the large chassis. Um, the connectors are all standardized. If we need to change one of the devices, it's easy to do that. They each come with their own control plane CPU, and they use standard protocols for synchronizing their state between each other. So if it's easy to take one in and out of service, and it's easy to ensure that they're all making the right forwarding decisions. So how do we attach host racks to this building block? Um, they just get connected to two or more of those, those frontier routers. Uh, the number of uplinks that the host rack uses is determined by the bandwidth requirements of that host rack. So for example, a rack of C5Ns, uh, which are all 100 gigabit a second instances, needs substantially more uplink capacity than a rack that's maybe composed of a previous generation like C4s. Um, so we are able to basically do variable amounts of uplink from the racks based on their traffic demand. And we kind of have a very crude example of that here where you can see some of the racks has four uplinks, others only have two, but they're all able to talk to each other. They all have unconstrained bandwidth within this cell uh, because they're able, they're, there's a full amount of interconnecting between the layers. And so traffic can flow inside this access cell uh, really easily. The challenge though is this is obviously a fixed size. And what happens when we run out of ports on it? How do we scale? And so this is where we start to approach the network in kind of a cellular manner like Werner was talking about today. We just start adding more access cells. And we keep doing that as the data center needs to grow and as more host racks need to be installed. So now we figured out we have a methodology, building blocks we can install in the data center that allow us to be elastic and just scale as the data center grows and as host capacity increases. But how are these going to talk together? And this is where we're going to introduce kind of our third building block. Uh, and that's what we're going to call a spine cell. And it's going to sit here on top. 
and the spine cells provide the capacity that interconnects each of these access cells in the data center. And every access cell is connected to every spine cell and there's sufficient uh, capacity here to deliver full uh, bisectional bandwidth. There's no constraint in bandwidth inside this. And this is what we call a, a placement group network. And this is visible to you as customers as a cluster placement group in which you can ensure that all of the EC2 instances in a cluster placement group will be placed on the same network in the same data center in order that they have low latency and unconstrained capacity between them. So in order to get out of the data center network, uh, we're gonna need a way to egress this placement group network. And so we just repeat our pattern and we dedicate some cells for providing connectivity out of the data center. And they're able to uh, be scaled based on demand. We can just keep attaching additional core cells as we need them in order to uh, keep up with utilization and ensure we have sufficient capacity. This is a very simple building block approach. We can just keep attaching cells one at a time. But let's talk about how this has evolved over time because one of the benefits of this approach is that as we add additional cells, they can take advantage of newer and better hardware and newer and better capabilities. So let's have a quick look at how we've evolved over time. So on the left is our original first generation uh, cell, access cell, it's built with devices using 10 gigabit ethernet. And on the right is our latest uh, 2019 third generation fabric, which is built with hardware that's using 400 gigabit ethernet. And just to give you a sense of the scale that these capacity these support in the data center, uh, in 2013, we were supporting placement group networks with over f nearly 500 terabits a second of capacity and 12 microseconds of latency across the fabric. And today, our latest generation is supporting 10,000 terabits or 10 petabits a second of capacity in the data center with only seven microseconds of latency, almost half the latency across the network. And so that turns out into being about a 20x increase in, in performance over the last six years. And we're real, uh, several years ago, my colleague James Hamilton, who was here, talked about how excited we were by the move to 25 gigabit ethernet because it took the same set of components that were used to deliver 10 gigabit ethernet and delivered 25 gigabit ethernet, so two and a half times the bandwidth for the same component count. And that made delivering 50 gigabit a second ports cheaper than 40 gigabit a second ports. Today, we're effectively making the next transition in that journey with moving from 25 gigabit interfaces to 100 gigabit interfaces using the same component count. Um, so a 4x increase in capacity uh, for only a very minor increase in hardware cost. It's slightly more expensive to make the interfaces do 100 gigabit, uh, but it's certainly a lot less than the bandwidth increase. And so you would have noticed, looking at those pictures, that the first generation switches were black and the latest generation switches were green. And we've previously shown you uh, our 25 gigabit, our second generation switch was blue. And the colors actually have meaning for us. It, uh, physically, the switches all look the same. They have the same connector layout on the front. And so they're very hard to tell apart. So in order to make our, our life easier for our field team when we're doing hardware replacements, the colors are actually used to signify the generation. So that when a, hard, a hard engineer is having to replace a device in the field, they replace it for one of the same color in order to simplify operations. Um, so it's one of those things we've done through the control of the hardware to simplify how we operate and build the network. Um, we, we keep the color coding to make it life easy for everyone. So we've talked through this topology that's built out of a large number of network devices, but how do we actually operate them? And how do we you know, operate that many devices and keep it uh, going? So there's three real pillars we think about here um, in terms of how we operate the network at scale. And so the first is a device lifecycle. And automation is key here. Uh, with so many devices in the network, we can't have things that are handcrafted or have any kind of difference. We don't want the devices to have any personality. We need them to be uh, conformed to what we want them to be. And so that starts off with software that generates the configuration for all of the devices that understands their role, which part of the network they're going to be in, what they have to connect to, and what features need to exist on that device. And then when devices are delivered into the data center, when we roll those cells off a truck, they're connected to the, the network, they're powered up, and they're automatically provisioned without a human having to interact with them. And they get the correct OS releases and the correct software packages, and then they're validated to ensure they're healthy, and then they're put into service, all without a human a network engineer having to be involved. And one of the things we do as part of our network design for every device role in the network, 
we have a function we call traffic shift that we're able to exercise to take traffic on or off that device in order to take it out of service. And this is a key part of how we keep the network, how we deploy to the network and enable us to have a continuous deployment pipeline. And so we have a system that just takes the device, we'll, we'll call the traffic shift function and take it out of service. We'll then deploy any needed configuration changes, any needed software updates. We'll verify the device is healthy and then place it back in service. And then we'll just go to the next device in the network and repeat. And uh, this is kind of like painting a bridge. We just we start at one end, we work our way across the network, and when we're done, we loop back around to the start. And so the network is always up to date, uh, fixes will go out in a timely manner, and we ensure that everything has the configuration it's supposed to have. So now we've got the devices operating and they have all of their, they're doing what we want them to do. How do we tell that they stay healthy? And this is really where the second prong of how we operate comes in, which is uh, device monitoring the devices. So we collect all the usual metrics you'd expect in terms of interfaces and system load. Uh, we, connect them at a very high, we collect them at a very high frequency. We extract signal from anywhere we can, uh, whether it's syslog messages, any events from the software daemons on the boxes, SDK errors in terms of controlling the hardware. We also go deep into the hardware and we'll pull out any hardware values we can in terms of register, table states. We'll pull information out of any of the optical interfaces, any of the optical modules in the switches. And we'll extract all that and we'll store it. And our telemetry team collect more than six trillion observations a day from the network, uh, which we store in CloudWatch. Um, the, we're one of the CloudWatch team's biggest customers. Um, but we take advantage of CloudWatch in order to store all that data and generate alarm events. But sometimes those metrics aren't enough and we need to get, generate new data or new insights into it. And so we do a couple of other things that we think are, are interesting in how we operate. Uh, one, we look for statistical deviations, changes in the behavior of the device that are anomalous. Either we, some examples are, we, we will look at all the traffic that goes into a device and compare it to all the traffic that's leaving. Those two should, have, what goes in should come out. And if that changes, we're able to suspect that there's something wrong. If any of the metrics maybe develop a big step change or something anomalous, we look at it, we'll trigger an event. Or if we see an error message or an, uh, from the hardware that we've never seen before, we'll, that will be statistically anomalous and we'll eventually, we'll tr that will trigger an event. We don't depend on a human to have pre-configured every possible alarm scenario. Um, so we dig into those as well in there. That forms part of the event stream that comes out of our monitoring system. But we can only trust the devices so much to tell us what's going on. And so we have another uh, string to our bow here, which is active data plane monitoring. And we, we probe the network continuously to ensure the traffic is healthy. And every host in the Amazon network is running our active monitoring agent. Uh, today, the agent is actually built into the Nitro controller, uh, so it's baked into the hardware. And those agents send test traffic between each other uh, continuously at a reasonably high data rate, and they cover the whole network. We, it ensures that every device and every link in the network is being monitored by multiple probes. And we're able to take the signal that comes back from all those probes to identify effectively in real time if a device becomes unhealthy um, through triangulation. Now, triangulating problems in the network uh, is an area we've had to invest very heavily in because it's much harder than it seems at first glance. Uh, firstly, the network topology is very large, and so you've got this huge amount of data you're trying to process. Uh, secondly, if something is broken in the network, it's possible that your telemetry has got, is one of the things that's been impacted by the network failure. And so both the success and failure data you're getting may be partial, and so you've got to try and deal with partial data. And the last bit that makes it challenging is we want to do this in almost real time. We want to process this partial data stream and identify the faulty component in a matter of seconds so that we can take action on it and trigger an alarm. So that's, they're kind of our main parts of how we think about gathering network telemetry. We do, however, store all of this telemetry data in a data lake in S3 uh, and use all of the standard AWS data analytics tools, so Athena, Glue, uh, QuickSight, to process this data to try and find patterns or any anomalies or things we think are worthy of further investigation. We allow it to track down and, and compare the reliability of components or if particular software releases are improving our, our uh, performance. So we, we take advantage of all the same data on X tools to process through that huge mountain of data we've collected uh, for analytics. But then the third, the third prong of how we operate the network is how we handle those events when we detect a problem in the network. And that's where we depend on automated remediation and repair. We don't want a human to have to investigate and deal with the problem. We want that to be dealt with by software. And so when an event comes in for a device that we think is unhealthy, 
our auto remediation system will take action and use that traffic shift feature to take the device out of service immediately and mitigate the customer impact. And it will actually check after it's removed the device from service that the impact has been removed. And if it sees the metrics go green, it knows it can move the device into our repair workflow. If it hasn't recovered the issue, it then knows to escalate to an engineer to, to dig in and figure out why. And as this system has improved, we're now at the point where almost all of the alarms and events that flow out of our monitoring system are dealt and managed with by software. And so humans are almost never involved in remediating network faults. But once we've got the fault mitigated and we need to go into repair, we also depend on the software systems to do that. And many faults can be fixed just through simple remote actions, either restarting software or rebooting the router. Uh, but sometimes they need physical repair. And in that case, the work is dispatched to our field team who will carry out whatever needed replacement action is required. And then the replacement device will be automatically provisioned and then verified to ensure that the fault is fixed. So if it was a bad link, we'll ensure that the link no longer has errors. If, you know, or if it was the switch was not programming its routing table correctly, we'll have validated that. And then once it's proved healthy, it'll be returned to service automatically. And so this is one of the things that computers are really good at is ensuring that things are tested the same way every time and ensuring they're correct and the responses are fast. And this, is a, this process is continuous and happening all the time, 24-7, ensuring that the network is healthy. OK. It's so not really talked about how we build the data, how we think about building the data center network and how we operate them. And so now we can kind of take a, a look at how we, how we put these data centers together and build regions and availability zones. So just as a reminder, availability zones provide fault isolation from other availability zones in the region. They're always physically separated from each other. They never share any facilities in common. Um, the availability zones are directly connected to each other in order to ensure that applications with latency requirements can run and, and do things like synchronous replication while still providing uh, physical separation. They have a large amount of capacity so that it's never uh, constrained. But the availability zones themselves have to be scalable. And the way we scale availability zones is by attaching multiple data, by having multiple data centers in the availability zones. So an availability zone is always at least one data center, but in a lot of cases it's many. And in our largest regions, such as uh, Virginia, um, you can have availability zones with more than 10 data centers composing them. And each of those 10 data centers has our network, our data center network that provides t thousands of terabits of capacity. So it's a lot of capacity and a lot of uh, hosts available to support people. So let's have a quick look at a simplified view of the regional network. So we see here we got um, three availability zones. You see the data centers within the availability zone are connected to each other directly in order to provide uh, capacity and lat low latency. And then the availability zones are, are interconnected with each other. Um, to keep the diagram simple, I haven't shown the links that go from availability zone around to availability zone three, but they, they do exist in order to ensure that there's full geographic diversity in terms of how, how things are connected together. So there's one piece of the topology that's missing here, and that's, that's our transit centers. And this is how we connect an AWS region out to the internet and the global backbone. Every availability zone is redundantly connected to the transit center uh, on its own uh, fiber. Uh, and the transit centers are in locations which have dense interconnection opportunities, usually uh, where there's internet exchanges or other uh, network operators so that we can interconnect easily. So if we update the, the diagram to show what that topology looks like, you end up with this view. Uh, where each transit center has connectivity into each, each availability zone, and so that a fault in an availability zone doesn't impact uh, services running in any of the other availability zones. So how do we build that network? And so this is where uh, we're gonna leverage the cellular architecture we talked about earlier. And so we'll start here with our placement group network at the bottom, and those uh, core cells we had at the top of that diagram are now here at the bottom. And we're going to attach those core cells into another set of spine devices. And these spine devices will also support cells connecting to other functions. In this case, these cells here are going to support uh, connectivity to other data centers in the same availability zone. Um, each, here we're leveraging the fact that these cells are, failure, are separate failure domains from each other. They have their own control plane. They're isolated from each other. And so a fault with any one of these doesn't impact any of the other uh, cells in the, in the core network. Uh, we can add other cells for other use cases. For example, we'll add cells dedicated to providing inter, inter AZ capacity. And 
Um, then finally, we'll add some cells for connecting northbound out of the data center up to the transit centers. Um, so sim leveraging the same design pattern, many devices in cells that provide strong isolation and lots of capacity. Each of these uh, cells has many routers in it. And one of the things that's really important about this design that we've come to love is we don't have anything operating in an active standby row. Uh, every device is carrying traffic all of the time. It's being monitored by our active monitoring system. We don't ever want to find ourselves in a situation where we fail from a, an active device to a standby device that it itself has developed a latent fault. So a pattern we, we depend on quite heavily is constant, constant work. Everything's in service and allows us to have lots of capacity to handle uh, bursts and be able to tolerate device failure. So that's the network inside the data centers. How do we actually connect them together? And that is going to depend on a lot of fiber. Um, within availability zones, uh, we have dark fiber spans, bulk cables. Um, the, the, sh the photos here on the top show uh, some of the cables we built several years ago that have more than 3,500 fiber cores in them. Uh, since then, we've developed newer versions that at this point are approaching 7,000 strands of fiber in a single cable, uh, which allows us to provide uh, lots of capacity. Um, we pay really careful attention to how those cables are installed. We map out the physical routes to ensure they have the lowest possible latency, but also that they have physical separation from each other so that they don't uh, suffer any failure modes in common. And for uh, connectivity, it has to go slightly further, for example, inter between availability zones or up to transit centers that may be a little further away than we want to use the bulk cables. We take advantage of d uh, dense wavelength division multiplexing to run multiple signals on a given fiber pair. And we can get up to 20 terabits a second out of a single fiber cable using the current generation of DWDM hardware. One of the other, um, one of the other benefits of DWDM is that we're able to take advantage of optical level failover to reduce the impact of physical faults. And before I show you an example of what that looks like, I just want to point out that the cable on the bottom right that's blue, that's a special cable we've had to build for use in Australia. The blue coating uh, discourages termites from wanting to eat the cable. Turns out uh, ter termites are one of the many uh, risk factors uh, that, it, that are, are present in the network. But let's look at what happens when we have a physical fault on the cable. Um, so this photograph is from one of our US regions earlier in the year. Uh, a construction crew uh, hit the cable with a, a bucket and while digging. Um, and as you can see, the cable is pretty badly damaged. Uh, it's not going to be many packets flowing through that. Um, um, but our optic, the optical level failover system saw this impact beginning and was able to transition the signals over to a, to a backup path. And that active monitoring system I talked about earlier that's generating thousands of packets a second of monitoring traffic saw only 13 packets dropped when that cable was hit. And effectively, that impact was invisible to customers, which is really important. And so while the links were all running on the backup path, we dispatched a construction crew out. They fixed the hole. We put in a replacement cable. They spliced it back together. Um, that takes about a day, because at this point, the cables have an awful lot of cable. There's an awful lot of cores in the cable, so it takes a while to splice it back together. But then they're able to bring it back online, again, without impact to customers. So that's, that's some of the challenges we see that we, we take advantage of to try and operate the network effectively. But this is a good way, this is a good point to segue into how do we secure customer traffic when it's outside of our data centers like this. And this is where earlier this year we, uh, we announced that we've been deploying physical network encryption um, on any link that passes outside of our physical control. So if it leaves our data centers in any way, uh, both within a region but also across the backbone, um, is protected by physical network encryption. So all traffic that would pass between avail availability zones or between regions, except uh, from China to the rest of the world, is carried on our backbone. Uh, most of the links are protected either with uh, MACSEC uh, or if it's DWDM, our DWDM hardware has implemented optical, level, optical encryption at the link level. Uh, the most of the links are all using AES-256. There is a very small number of links that are still using AES-128 on some older hardware that's in the process of being retired. Um, the MACSEC implementation is one we've customized ourselves because it's running on our own hardware platforms uh, in order to ensure that it has forward secrecy. So even if someone had recorded the traffic and at a later date got the encryption keys back, they could, it's impossible for them to recover the data. Um, 
And in the cases of maybe a small number of links uh, that cross short distances, for example, maybe across a corridor in a, uh, a data center where there's a shared corridor, or maybe where there's two data centers where they're across the road from each other, we actually take advantage of laser monitoring of the cables. We have uh, devices that attach to the cable, and they generate light pulses down the cable, and they're able to detect minute, vari minute vibrations in the cable. If someone was attempting to touch the cable, they'll trigger an alarm, and our security team are able to respond and investigate. This is a very exciting piece of technology, and it allows us to do uh, control uh, the security on the cables. So that's an example of how uh, we protect your traffic. And for example, if you were using VPC encryption we talked about earlier, that traffic is then encrypted the second time. So if traffic passing between availability zones would have two layers of encryption on it, so it's, it's doubly protected. So and that's a good segue to talk about then is our global backbone. The global backbone uh, is used for a number of AWS services. Uh, for example, uh, Direct Connect or Global Accelerator or just traffic between AWS regions. As so you've probably seen this diagram a bit this week, this is how our global infrastructure looks. It has all 22 regions, uh, 210 uh, CloudFront locations, plus 97 Direct Connect locations. Each of these links on the diagram are composed of one or more 100 gig a bit a second Ethernet links. Uh, many of them are actually in tens or maybe multiple tens of, uh, of links, so terabits of capacity. Um, and they're interconnected together. And so why do we have a backbone network? And it goes back to some of those tenants we talked about earlier. Uh, firstly, it's security. We want to control the traffic and what infrastructure traverses. We don't want to hand it off to a third party uh, and not have control of it. We want to ensure availability. We want to uh, both have control over scaling and redundancy. We want to ensure that there's always sufficient headroom for physical faults. We want to control the hardware it's running over so we can operate it to the best. We want to control the performance. We want to ensure that we know where the traffic's going to go in failure, what the backup paths are going to be. And we want to be able to connect closer to our customers in order to maximize uh, their customer experience. We want to avoid internet hotspots or any suboptimal connectivity. And when we think about building that global backbone, we have to focus on a couple of things. Firstly, we want to, latency really matters. The physical distances are large. The speed of light is unfortunately a constraint. We've not yet been able to work around, so we're doing our best. Um, so we, we spend a lot of time thinking about how, how, how circuits are going to be routed what's going, and how they're going to be managed. And additionally, we want to make sure that when physical failures occur, that the backup paths add the smallest possible amount of additional latency. And as I said, 100 gig is the new normal in the, data, in the backbone. Uh, everything is at least 100 gig in order to provide a burst headroom for any spikes in traffic. And we're going to use many of the same design patterns we have from the data centers uh, to operate the backbone network. But before we talk about that, let's talk a little bit about what it means to actually care about uh, how we build the fiber paths. So for the backbone fiber paths, we go to extreme lengths to audit them and understand how they're, how they're built and where they're physically laid. Um, as I said, these routes are really long, and potentially thousands of kilometers, and that means there's just many opportunities for there to be risks exposed to it. So we want to understand how is that, where is that cable going? Is it going through a tunnel, a rail tunnel, where there may be a risk of a derailment or something else that could damage the cable? Is it crossing a bridge that might be at risk from being damaged during flooding or washed away? Um, are there areas that are prone to construction? Uh, in the cases of subsea fibers, is any of it in areas that are prone to heavy fishing or trawling that may, may damage it? And then we also want to understand if and when it, has a, it gets damaged, how is it going to be repaired? Um, it can be challenging, you know, it, the, unlike Metro where it's easy to dispatch a crew to go repair something the same day, if there's a sub break on a submarine cable, it may take several weeks for a repair ship to get there particularly if the weather's bad uh, in the winter. Um, it, can, it can be challenging to get repairs. So your recovery time might be long, and so we need to plan, we need to understand those risks so we can plan for how long it's going to take to repair. And we also want to understand the fiber path diversity. We care, we want to make sure we understand anywhere where two paths may have commonalities. Maybe there's one cable that's running east-west across the country and another cable that's running north-south. We want to know exactly where they cross, how much of it's common, what are the risks, 
can we get any kind of separation? Maybe one's on the, on the road below an underpass and the other one's gonna cross on a bridge across the top and so they're vertically separated. But we wanna go chase down all those details and make sure we understand. And then we also wanna make sure that they stay that way, that they don't change when we're not looking. So one of the things we do is we measure the latency of all of these backbone circuits continuously. And if they change, or maybe there's a, an event, the link goes down and it comes back a couple of hours later after it's been repaired, but the latency has changed by tens of milliseconds. We know someone's, or maybe two or three milliseconds, we know someone's just added several hundred kilometers of fiber into the circuit. The length of the cable has changed, which means possibly it's ended up going on a path we didn't know about. And so we'll, we will then use that to trigger an investigation and make sure we understand where the connectivity is going. And additionally, we want to understand what are the capacity of scale limitations. And what is the type of fiber on these long haul routes? How much capacity can we get down it? Maybe it's slightly older, doesn't support as many circuits as newer cables. And, and so we want to make sure we understand where those constraints are going to be so that we can go dig in uh, and, op and, and make it better. So how do we actually build this network? What's it look like? And you're probably going, hey, I recognize this diagram. Uh, it looks remarkably similar to what we do in the data center. Uh, we again have multiple cells that we're deploying. Uh, in this case, we're, we're using them uh, to provide either connectivity to remote backbone locations or provide egress out into our transit centers or edge pops. And just like in the data center, we want to take advantage of a large number of devices so as to minimize the capacity loss when a device fails. So we go wide across all of these devices to ensure that they don't uh, that a device failure only impacts a very small percentage of the traffic capacity. So what are the services that run in our edge pops? Uh, we're gonna take a quick look through some of these. So there's, as I said, there's a bunch of AWS services run in our edge pops. You've got Direct Connect and CloudFront and Route 53 uh, along with others. But we also use edge pops for our global network access and our external internet connectivity and so why do we want to use it for those? Like what are the, what's, how, does, how does Amazon connect to the internet? And so we want to connect to the internet in the most optimal way possible. Um, and we're going to do that through two days. We're going to take advantage of the transit centers we talked about earlier that are part of the regions, but also the edge pops that are spread across the global backbone. And we use those to extend our internet access out uh, from a region as wide as we can, uh, both to ensure we get the best possible uh, performance for customers. We deliver the traffic as close to the destination network as we can, uh, avoid any congestion that might happen. We also use this as a way to ensure that we can scale the network appropriately. If we delivered all the traffic originated by an AWS region to networks in that one location, we'd, we would overwhelm many of those networks. And so by taking advantage of the backbone, we take the traffic and we spread it out wider across a region uh, and ensure that we don't generate any hotspots and that we can control how traffic flows through. And this allows us to have a much greater aggregate amount of connectivity uh, to, uh, for, for delivering traffic for customers. And allows us to suffer, uh, manage for failure in the event that someone, uh, either us or a network op another network operator has a fault in a particular uh, location, we're able to just move that traffic to another location and still have sufficient capacity to deliver it to them. And so edge pops, again, built on a very similar pattern that we've seen before. Uh, in this case, we're dedicating bricks both for connecting back into our backbone network and also cells for connecting to both external internet uh, networks, uh, service providers that we're peering with. But then we also have cells dedicated to the various AWS functions that are running as AWS services that are running inside the POPs. And here's again an example of where we're using our cellular architecture to provide isolation. If CloudFront has a big event, maybe there's, you know, it's Thursday night football or uh, and some other, another customer is uh, generating a large amount of traffic because they've done maybe an update to a, a game or, or some other thing, then we don't want any issues there to impact customers running on the next Direct Connect or Route 53 performance. So we take advantage of the cellular architecture to provide isolation and separation. And so a quick talk about why some of these services are taking advantage of our edge pops. So, CloudFront is our content distribution network and Route 53 is our DNS service. Both of those services want to have the lowest possible latency to the end users. And so by being distributed out across our edge, our 200 plus edge locations, 
they get the lowest possible latency uh, to users and direct access to the networks that those users are based on. Uh, in almost many of these pop edge pop locations were directly peered with the largest access providers in those markets and so we're able to deliver traffic directly to the end users. CloudFront's also able to take advantage of the backbone for doing origin fetches back to either S3 or to resources running in EC2 in, in the region. So they're able to take advantage of the backbone for low latency and high performance origin fetches. Direct Connect uh, is used for customers to access their uh, VPC resources privately, also public services. Again, low latency access, get as close to our customers as possible. Customers can connect to their nearest Direct Connect location, either directly or with one of our partner networks. And then they're able to use the backbone network to access resources in any AWS region, region in the world. Um, and they can they do that. In these locations, we always have multiple uh, customer-facing edge riders, so customers can land their circuits across two devices for redundancy, but they can also then connect across multiple POPs for geographic diversity as well if they desire. AWS Shield is our DDoS attack mitigation platform. Uh, it provides traffic scrubbing, and we want that deployed out at the edge locations because we want to be able to classify and eliminate attack traffic as soon as possible. We don't want to have to carry that across the backbone where it might uh, uh, put other customer traffic at risk. We want to be able to identify and stop the traffic at source, and it's all done automatically uh, as the traffic enters the network. And then finally, Global Accelerator, AWS Global Accelerator. So Global Accelerator provides any cast-like functionality for customers. You get a pair of static, statically assigned IP addresses. They're advertised out of diverse POPs, so no one location will advertise both IP addresses. This ensures that your traffic is always routed to diverse POPs where it enters our backbone. And then it can be routed across our backbone for the consist consistent performance. And customers have the ability to control how that traffic is forwarded, which regions the traffic is delivered to. So you can do regional uh, routing. You can have users in Europe directed to resources in Europe and users in the North America go to US-based resources and with failover and uh, traffic distribution control. And it's all easy to set up and manage. You don't have to do any tricks with like BGP announcements to the internet or anything. We, you have explicit policy control and can control how the traffic uh, flows away. So that's kind of the set of services running. And so as we finish up, I wanna just say, touch back on what we talked about before, which is hopefully you've seen how we design the network to ensure a strong isolation from failures, how we take advantage of our extensive network monitoring and auto remediation to ensure that we detect and mitigate faults as fast as possible, and that we ensure that through redundancy and over provisioning that we can manage those faults without impacting uh, customer experience that ensure consistent performance for you, and that we're able to scale the network at every layer without constraint, and we take advantage of our control over the hardware and software platforms to deliver features such as encryption and such as optical failover to allow us to give uh, the best possible uh, experience. So if you want to know about any of the services I talked about, um, we have a large amount of uh, training material you can look up. Um, but that's basically all I had today for folks. We have about 10 minutes left, and so I'm happy to take questions if folks have stuff they want to know more about. I believe we have a microphone uh, somewhere for folks have questions. Sure. Yes, so the question is you're saying, asking if they really say there were 7,000 strands. And yes, there, we have bulk fiber cables now that in a 40 something millimeter or two inch cable has, I think it's 6,900 and something, I can't remember the exact, so it's just barely below 7,000. We effectively, several years ago, we went public with a, a cable that had 3,546, and then that's just, over time, as we've worked with our partners, we figured out how to package more strands into the same physical space, so we just rope it just 7,000 strands. Uh, it takes a reasonably large amount of time to splice one of those back together if someone cuts it. It's a, it's a multi-crew job. Gentleman down the back there. Yeah. 
So the, the question you're asking is, how do I ensure that the encryption is working properly? Okay, so the question is, given that encryption changes, may potentially change the size of the data that's leaving the device, how do we, how do we monitor it? Um, we understand how the encryption is modifying the packet sizes, and so we're able to effectively account for that in the model. If you know the traffic leaving on in interfaces that are encrypted are always 2% bigger, we're able to account for that in the monitoring system and, and calibrate it for it. This one? Okay. This one? Oh, sorry. I'm looking at the wrong one. That one. No. So the, so the question is, do these blocks represent single devices? And no, they are representing that cellular kind of network building block we described earlier in the talk. So they are composed of many, many network devices in that, in that block. Um, commonly, you know, 16, 32 types of devices. So they provide uh, a large amount of redundancy and single device failing is only four or five percent of the capacity. No, so these are, um, so some of them are uh, have been commercial boxes, but predominantly this is all our own uh, custom built uh, routers that we use in the data center and now across the, the backbone network. So, so there's a fixed form factor. For, yes? Yep. Uh, so the question is, within the placement group network, is it non-blocking? And the answer is yes. We have sufficient capacity to not be blocking inside that. And so that's uh, how um, we deliver kind of high capacity, like HPC type wor workloads on top of the placement group network. So you should never see constraints inside the placement group. So the gentleman here, I'll, I'll get the first. Yep. Uh, so the question is, do we own all of these undersea cables? And the answer is no. Um, uh, we are owners of several subsea cables. We've announced in the past our, our investment in several uh, Trans-Pacific and Transatlantic cables. Um, so generally, it's a mix of either cables we own or infrastructure we're leasing from cable operators. Um, and the same with the terrestrial. We're involved in kind of joint ventures there with folks, so we're leasing fibers from folks, and then we're or releasing capacity from into it, from companies and then using it. So, yeah. Uh, so the question is, do we run custom protocols, uh, routing protocols for things like InterZ? Uh, we try to, as much as possible, stick to uh, standard, industry standard protocols, things like OSPF and BGP, because they're well understood, they're well verified. We do take advantage of the fact that we have control over the software platform to uh, customize them where it makes sense. Well, it can be, in, so InterAZ can be um, quite a good distance. It can be like 100 plus kilometers in order to provide physical separation. Well, it's, yeah, we've, we have our DWDM hardware to provide that connectivity and then we attach our standard routers to that. Sure. Uh, I have Okay. So yeah, so the question is at our scale, we must be using multiple vendors, and so how do we manage those multiple vendors? Um, so we have multiple hardware partners that we're that providing, that we're building 
working with to build the, the writers we use in our network. Um, they're custom to us. But we run our own operating system and control plane stock on top of those. So that is consistent across all the devices. So effectively, even though there may be multiple generations of hardware or hardware from multiple manufacturers, uh, from multiple ODMs, they're running our own operating system and, and protocol stack on top. So that's effectively how they're consistent. No, it's largely all internally, because some of it predates a lot of that work. So we, we have our own kind of ecosystem for that management software. Gentleman on the far right there. So the question is, how does Outpost uh, change this? Um, and it's, it's certainly bringing some changes, uh, mainly the, the, the racks are far away, but almost all of the same technology and systems are being used in Outpost racks. So for example, our active monitoring solution I described earlier, because it's integrated into the Nitro cards, it's present in the Outpost rack, and so we're able to use that to monitor the health of the network inside an Outpost deployment, for example. Cool. There's some little Okay, so, so the question is, how does the forward secrecy work in encryption? Um, so it's not actually TLS, but it's using the same underlying cryptographic primitives. I'm not a cryptographic expert. I would, I can happily bring you to our crypto team later and they can, uh, they've been deeply involved in ensuring that the encryption meets the bar that they set. Great, okay, we'll take one last question and then we'll Oh, so the question is how long, how do we roll out software changes and how long does it take us to get it across the world? Yeah. Um, so generally we like all continuous deployment processes. You know, we'll do a small number, we do one box, we'll do a small number, we maybe do only one availability zone and let it soak for a period of time to ensure that it's, it's correct and there's no, there's no errors. And then expand kind of geometrically across the world doing more regions, more availability zones. And so deployments can take um, from days to weeks, depending on how aggressive we want to be, but generally, uh, it's, it's kind of it's kind of a couple of weeks to a month or so to just roll across the world as uh, as it goes. Great, um, we're just about out of time. Uh, thank you all for staying and, and talking. Uh, I'll, I'll be here for a couple of minutes. We can I can take further questions, and um, if not, if you don't have time for that, I'll be back at our booth, global infrastructure booth in the expo in the. Venetian later today, and either myself or one of my colleagues will happily take your questions. Um, and I'd ask that you all, if you could, uh, complete your session survey in the mobile app. Let us know what you liked and didn't like and what you'd like to see more of. Uh, your feedback helps drive the agenda and, and, what, and, what, and what we present. So thank you very much, and have enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>